Okay, good morning, everybody. And thank you for coming this morning and worshiping here. As you were, uh, I'm, go I'm going to assume that almost all of you, if not all of you, are aware of the fact that uh, this weekend we're doing a series. And we started off last night, and the title of this series is True to His Word, Understanding and Defending the Biblical Account of Our Origins. And we're going to be looking at how we can more effectively share the Word of God with the world around us as it is in the year 2022. So last night we spoke on the topic of the Tower of Babel and ancient man, and we learned several things. The fact that there is only one race of, of mankind, and that is the human race, okay? And we have different people groups within that human race, and that we start off intelligent, and we start off with a very robust genetic makeup, but over the last 6,000 years, we're, uh, if you'll excuse the term, de-evolving, okay? Uh, because we're becoming more genetically corrupt, which flies exactly in the opposite of how evolution would have us, have us to believe. And while the vast majority of the world out there is saying, oh, uh, we all got here from random processes, or even worse, we got here by aliens, okay? So we know and we believe that God's word is true, but how do we take that message of the truth of God's word to a world that's been told a different story? So today, our talk is on why apologetics, why now? Now, if the term apologetics is new to you, don't worry, because we're going to discuss that and what it means. This afternoon, we're going to look at Noah and those pesky dinosaurs. Why did I give it this title? Because the topic of dinosaurs uh, is very confusing to a lot of Christians. In fact, uh, from the time that dinosaurs were first discovered in about uh, the year uh, 18 something or other, the evolutionists immediately co-opted that and said, oh, these critters must have lived millions of years ago. Okay, well, millions of years does not coincide with the history in the Bible. So how do we understand dinosaurs so that we can take that truth back? And how does that relate to Noah and the global flood? And then speaking of Noah and the global flood, oh, by the way, now, this talk was in, in some of the bulletins, some of the flyers it's scheduled to begin at two o'clock and in another one it says 2.30. What we're going to do at two o'clock is we have a video that we're going to share with you. It's a, uh, it's a family friendly video. So children of all ages from, uh, oh, I'd say three to 93, right? Um, you, will en you will enjoy this. It was uh, done by a friend of mine up in Oregon who is a professional ventriloquist. And him and his associate, Sidney Redwood, uh, are going to present some very fascinating facts about creation. And so we'll, and we'll, so we'll start that at 6, run that till 6.30. Then at 6.30, we'll start the actual uh, presentation. And then in the evening at 6 o'clock p.m., we'll, we'll look at a talk called Road Trip, Evidence of Global Catastrophe in the Four Corners Region. What we're going to do is we're going to take you on a little trip through some of Arizona up in the Four Corners area and show you a whole bunch of geological features which are best explained in the context of a global flood, not millions of years of slow gradual processes. So that's what we have lined up for today and the rest of the week. And then while I'm in town, incidentally anyway, uh, tomorrow morning at around 10.30, I'll be speaking at a particular church. I don't remember the exact title of it right now. I have the address. Uh, down in Palominas. So if anybody's interested in heading down there tomorrow morning, uh, I'll be there as well, uh, giving a talk on two dozen reasons to believe in a biblical account of creation. So that having been said, why apologetics? Why now? Why Christians in today's world need more than ever to know why they believe what they believe? Okay, believing is important. But can we defend why we believe what we believe? So I have a, a video file I'm going to share with you now. And I'm going to show up this logo here. This comes from uh, Creation Ministries International. They're a creation-based group that has international offices around the country. In America, they're, state, uh, they're headquartered in Powder Springs, Georgia. But they have a little audio video that I'm going to share with you. And I want you to look at... Uh, some of the, it's going to show you some of the different messages that our culture is being bombarded with today. And then it's going to ask some questions. And I want you to pay careful attention to those questions as they come up on the screen. And if it's all working, we should 
Here we go. Most people believe the Bible is true. Has science proven the Bible is wrong? Is creation and evolution a side issue? Our ancestors understood origins by extrapolating from their own experience. How else could they have done it? Then science came along and taught us that we are not the measure of all things. The simplest explanation is, there is no God. No one created the universe, and no one directs our fate. You and I are the product of billions, billions of years, billions of years. We share a common years, ancestor with chimpanzees. This animal eventually became human. I'm sorry, but if you don't understand that humans and monkeys came from a if common you ancestor... single out evolution and act as if there's some kind of major scientific dispute, and in evolution fact... Evolution is a fact, not a theory. E evolution is a fact. I mean, that, that, that's right. There's no question Evolution about. isn't an opinion, it's fact. Evolution is a scientific fact. I'm sorry, I believe in evolution. It's in the ocean 200 million years ago. Years. Eight million years ago, we emerged from microbes and muck. People have questions, but there are answers, and we can get ourselves equipped. As we said last night, the rejection of God's word is the biggest crisis facing our culture today. And our purpose this weekend is to equip you to be able to make a difference in the life of someone who may not see that yet, okay? So a little bit of an outline here. I have an introduction and some acknowledgments to make, and then as an overview, I want to talk about the purpose of this presentation, the definition of the word apologetics. I want to talk about the creation evolution debate as it's going on in our culture. I then want to shift and focus on understanding how evolution or the belief in evolution impacts our culture. That in turn will impact how we evangelize people and along the way share some resources and then draw some conclusions. What can we do? All right, by way of introduction, my name is Michael Jerome Calcano. I was born August 10, 1955 at Good Samaritan Hospital in Portland. For those of you who came last night, a little repeat here for those who didn't make it. Uh, I had my born again experience in January of 81. I was baptized on September 19th, 1981. That would have been 41 years and five days ago. Uh, prior to that, I served in the United States Navy as an electrician's mate from 73 to 77. And then I spent six years with the Oregon Army National Guard as a anti-tank missile gunner and then as a personnel clerk. It was while I was serving in the Army National Guard that I became a Christian and a Seventh-day Adventist. I uh, went on to graduate from Portland State University in December of 1986 with a degree in elementary education. I taught in Oregon public schools for a little over 17 years. My wife and I moved to Arizona in March of 2013, and I currently serve as the Vice President of the Gila and Navajo Divisions of the Arizona Origin Science Association. <sighs> okay, got all that out. Now, and just for fun, I was able to throw this in here. This was a photocopy of the article from the North Pacific Union Conference Gleaner. We get the recorder here in the Pacific Union, in the North Pacific Union, it's the Gleaner. And it was an article about my uh, coming into the truth. From Bingo to Bible Study, Gresham Man Finds a New Life. Uh, I came about uh, through a rather unorthodox series of events, which I won't go into today, maybe some other time perhaps. Uh, this is a picture of my wife and myself um, in May of 2014, shortly after we moved to Arizona here. We're standing at the Salt River Canyon. 
I want to make the following acknowledgments. These are some of the people and or ministries that have influenced me over the many years that I've been doing this and going through the list. And then that brings us to currently I serve. This is the Arizona Origin Science Association logo. And we have a website. And this is a screenshot of the website. We currently have nine different divisions that meet in 10 different locations across the state of Arizona. And you can see down in the lower corner there, we have a Cochise division that meets here in Sierra Vista. I am not the vice president for that. The, the vice president's name is John Vanderhoof. I'll be meeting up with him uh, possibly this evening, but for tomorrow for sure. And he schedules meetings where we bring in guest speakers into town and they give uh, talks generally once a month, but we don't meet in December and we sometimes don't meet in November. And he also runs meetings over in uh, Santa Cruz County, over in Sonoida as well. I run the meetings in Payson and in Sholo, but uh, just recently, um, last week, I was in Tucson giving a talk. Just the other day, I was in Tempe giving a talk instead of in Mesa there. The, the vice president who heads the Lake Havasu City Division, his name is Joe Fisher, who's also a Seventh-day Adventist, but our organization, uh, we have a lot of different Protestant Christians from several different churches. So we try to reach as many people as we can in our ministry and bring them the type of information that we're sharing with you this weekend. So that being said, the purpose of this presentation this morning is to build up your faith in the authority of the Word of God. And we summarize that by saying, does God say what he means and does he mean what he says? Okay. And we're going to provide you with a few helpful resources on the topic of biblical creation versus evolution and how to better defend the authority of Scripture. The Scripture is under attack in our culture today. Okay, why? From how? From the lies that are being told about how everything got here in the first place. Now, we all want to say that without question, the crucifixion and re death and resurrection of Christ was the most important event to happen in human history, okay? More than creation, the fact that the creator who put it all together came down, became one of us, died the death that we deserve so that we might live the life that he deserves. And we want to bring people to Christ. We want them to understand the significance of Calvary. How do we get them there? We have to do that through God's word. But what if somebody has rejected God's word summarily because of what they have been taught, which would be that God's word is irrelevant, it's just a collection of stories, it isn't really true, has no bearing on our life in the year 2022? Well, we're here to see if we can't turn that around. But in order to do that, we have to begin with Genesis. So that leads us to the question of, well, why is the topic of evolutionism which is the belief in evolution, versus creationism, which is the belief in creation. Why is this topic important? Why is this debate between creationism and evolutionism becoming more pronounced in our culture today? Well, again, if the evolutionists get out in front with the narrative, then they control the narrative, okay? And we, though, can take that narrative back. The issue is not about science versus religion. It is actually between two different worldviews or philosophies about life and death, about origins and eternal destinies. As an example, Time Magazine, November 13th, 2006, ran this cover, God versus Science, as if somehow God were opposed to science, okay? God is the author of science. Now, just as a little aside here, Seven years before I became a Christian, okay, I attended my very first rock concert. It was Grand Funk Railroad uh, performing in uh, Seattle, Washington. The ticket back then I think was $10, okay. And during that time, during that uh, concert, they sang a song, and the song was titled Inside Looking Out. And it was originally written and performed by Eric Burden and the Animals several years before. Now, did I have to tell you this? No. But... This is the lead and I want to make to a very, very important point. So I really wanted to get your attention on this, okay? And that is this, that for the purpose of today's message, let's try to consider what it might be like for somebody who is 
outside looking in, okay? We need to be more aware of how somebody who is on the outside of Christianity views the claims of Christianity, okay? How does somebody out there in the world who is a skeptic, who is a non-believer, who's been sold a bill of goods on the theory of evolution and how we all got here from random natural processes, how does that person view the claims of Christianity? How does that person view the authority of God's word? Okay, so that's what we have to consider as we're looking at this. Let me summarize it by asking it this way. How does a typical non-believer in today's culture view the claims of the Bible and Christianity? And then that leads us to try to understand better how do we present this? How do we take God's word to the people in this culture who have been, for want of a better term, brainwashed into believing a lie, the lie of evolution? Well, we can do that by understanding, first of all, the seven C's of history. Now, the gospel will not make sense unless we include all seven of these points. If any of them are left out, it becomes very, very difficult to defend Christianity because the Bible, you see, was given to us so that we have a comprehensive understanding of where we came from, which then gives us a much clearer picture of where we are going. So it begins with creation. Genesis 1.31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Well, after the creation came corruption, okay? We know about that from reading in Genesis chapter 3. After the corruption, so many years later, there was a catastrophe. That would be the flood of Noah's day. After the flood was over and people began to repopulate the earth, there was confusion brought on at the Tower of Babel. Okay, and that was where we get all the different people groups, all the different nationalities that we have on the planet today. Eventually, that brings us to Christ. Christ brings us to the cross, and the next phase that's waiting to be uh, played out is the consummation of all things. If we were to sabotage any one of these aspects, and we try to bring the gospel, that's going to lead to unanswered questions. Okay, so... This is where biblical apologetics comes in. Now, what does that mean? What does the term apologetics mean? Simply put, apologetics is the branch of theology concerned with the defense or proof of Christianity. This comes from dictionary.com. Bible.org tells us that apology is derived from the Greek word apology, apologetics, excuse me, derived from the word apology, which was originally used as a speech of defense or an answer given in reply. In ancient Athens, it referred to a defense made in a courtroom as part of a normal judicial procedure. And creation.com reads this way. The term Christian apologetics doesn't refer to apologizing or saying sorry for being a Christian. It comes from the Greek word apology, meaning defense. The Greek term refers to a reasoned defense that would be given in a court of law. So if you want to win your case with someone that you're witnessing to, you want to have the best evidence available. And the best evidence available, actually, is a personal testimony. And we have that right here in God's Word. Why is it important? Why is the topic of creationism important for defending biblical authority? Because without it, if we deny the creation account and we accept millions of years for human evolution, we will have no authoritative basis for, first of all, the seven-day week. Where do we get that from? We get that from God's Word. We would have no authoritative basis for marriage, Genesis 2.24. What do we see in our culture today as relates to marriage? I don't have to tell you. You already know that. We would have no authoritative basis for sin. What is sin? There are some churches that teach that sin is really just a lack of self-esteem. Okay? But God's Word tells us that sin is rebellion against God. We would also have no authoritative basis for clothing, uh, nobody in here has that problem, so we don't have to really spend too much time talking about that. But ultimately, ultimately, if we accept all those things, then we have no need of a Savior because we're evolving, we're doing along pretty well without God, thank you very much. Okay, so in short, evolution or evolutionism makes Jesus out to be a liar. And to prove that, we just have to go to Matthew 19, verse 4. And he, that would be Jesus, answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And what did we say was the beginning last night? We said Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. 
In Matthew 23, verse 35, Jesus is also again speaking, and he says, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah. Jesus himself believed that Abel was an actual historical person. Okay, he wasn't just some fictitious account about some fictitious person that existed in some long distant past. You see, the devil doesn't have to attack the entire Bible to get people to disbelieve the Bible. He doesn't even have to attack Daniel and Revelation, which are two books that Adventists are very fond of. He only has to undermine the first 11 chapters of Genesis. If the devil can get people to believe that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are just allegory or fiction or metaphor, then he's done his work because from that point on, it's like, well, do I really have to believe the rest? Well, why can't I just believe part of it? Why do I have to believe all of it? Why do I have to believe what Jesus says regarding salvation? So what we're going to do as we discussed last night is we are going to make the Bible the foundation, the starting point for our thinking in every area, in every area. Romans 3 verse 4 in the New English translation reads this way, let God be proven true and every human being shown up as a liar just as it is written so that you will be justified in your words and will prevail when you are judged. What is evolutionism? Let's take another few seconds to look at exactly what does evolutionism entail. It is the belief that all living things came into existence through random natural processes. In other words, life came from non-life, which is a scientific biological impossibility. But worse than that is it comes with no inherent meaning or purpose or direction. Okay, we see people today looking at life with a very futile attitude. Okay, and that's why we have suicides, that's why we have depressions, that's why we have a lot of the mental illnesses that we have. Because without God to give us hope that there's something better, it can lead to despair. So, who is an evolutionist then? Well, for the purposes of our talk today, that would refer to somebody in the scientific or academic or media community who have a biased interest in advocating the theory of evolution and, and the exclusion of any creator or intelligent designer. Now, I'm going to share a very key point with you. I'm going to drill this into your heads several times this morning. So you're going to see this more than once, but this really is pivotal to understanding what we're trying to accomplish here today. Evolutionism is a philosophy which teaches that man, independent of any divine revelation, determines for himself or herself what is truth. If we don't have the Word of God to ground us in reality, reality becomes anything we want it to be in our imagination. Is anybody here familiar with this face? It's okay if you don't. This is Richard Dawkins. He is a zoologist and the former professor for public understanding of science at Oxford University. He held a very prestigious position. He once made this claim. He said, it is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. He said this uh, in the New York Times in 1989. Now, let me ask you a question. If you don't have the Bible as your standard for truth, how would you define wickedness? Okay. I like to think of Richard Dawkins as a walking contradiction. Why do I say that? Because Richard Dawkins has made it his primary purpose in life to go around the world trying to convince people that there is no purpose to life. Okay, Do you see the problem that evolution has? If everything is random, natural, unguided, and we're all just biological accidents, then why get upset about anything? Why matter what other people think if they think differently than you do? The founders of modern science were primarily all Christians. This is just a partial list. And these scientists believe that science would lead them to understand the mind of God in his creation, or as Kepler put it, to think God's thoughts after him. Now, the devil, knowing that, knowing that science actually draws people to God, figured out, well, I've got to find a way to get science to draw people away from God. And that's where the theory of evolution comes in handy. So he had to come up with a plan to turn that around. Why? Because, as you remember, Evolutionism teaches that man, independent of divine revelation, determines for himself or herself what is truth. I'm going to make the claim today that it is not because of pot 
that our culture is going to pot, okay? It is not the fault of Elvis or the Beatles, okay, or Hugh Hefner, okay? It wasn't the invention of Nintendo or the internet. In fact, I will even go so far as to say it is not the fault of public schools, okay? Because Cain killed his brother before any of these things became an issue. The problem is our culture has rejected the Bible as being authoritative. They have rejected the authority of God's word. They're choosing not to believe it, and they want others to not believe it along with them. So, that being said, let's go back to God's word and look at how some of this all got started. Really quickly here, I don't think with this audience I need to go through point by point by point, word by word. But in Genesis 3, okay, the serpent is deceiving Eve. He tells her that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So then the woman saw the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, desirable to make one wise, so she thought. She took of its fruit and ate. She gave to her husband and he ate. The eyes of both of them were open. They knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And in a figurative sense, mankind has been sewing fig leaves for himself ever since. Now, it's important to understand Eve's temptation because it is the same temptation that everyone on the planet faces today, even Christians. What is that temptation? It came in two parts. The first part is that she had the right to decide for herself who was telling the truth, God or the serpent. And the second part was that she was smart enough on her own to decide who was telling the truth, God or the serpent. Okay? Can you see how this is the issue that faces everyone today? Well, I think I can live apart from God's word. I don't think I have to follow the Bible to have a good life or to have a happy life or to have a productive life or whatever. And some people appear to have happy, productive lives, but they're missing, going to miss out on the biggest event that's going to come, which is the consummation of all things. And this is the same temptation that people face today. Why? Because evolutionism teaches that man, independent of divine revelation, determines for himself what is truth. That being so, then what is it that gives evolutionism such appeal? Well, the answer was right back there in Genesis 3, verse 5. Your eyes will be open and you will be like God. You don't have to be accountable to anybody. In fact, maybe somebody else should be accountable to take care of you, like maybe the government. What is the impact of evolutionism on evangelism? How can we effectually reach people who have a worldview based on atheistic, without God, naturalism, which means nature is all there is, which we summarize by using the phrase evolutionism. How can we reach them with the saving news of the gospel? 1 Corinthians 1, 23 tells us something very insightful. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Now, why was it a stumbling block for the Jews? Well, because the Jews who had the true biblical history, they understood what sin was. They understood the condition of man. They understood that we were created good and that we've been corrupted. They understood that if they accepted Christ as the Messiah, they would have to make a few lifestyle changes. And for the most part, they weren't ready to give that up. They liked things the way they were. But why was it foolishness to the Greeks? Because the Greeks did not have that same historical background. They believed in a bunch of gods that had limited powers, would scrap back and forth and things like this. Okay. And so they did not have the same understanding for all those issues that the Jews had. Well, I don't think it's any stretch to be able to say that our culture today is more like the Greeks than the Jews. President Barack Obama said during his inaugural address on January 20th, 2009, he said, we are a nation of Christians and Muslims, Jews and Hindus, and non-believers. We are shaped, he said, by every language and culture drawn from every end of this earth. And you know what? He was essentially correct when he said this, okay? We have allowed the idea of multiculturalism, and everybody has a right to believe what they want to believe, and everybody's viewpoint is as valid as everybody else's. We have lost what the late Chuck Colson described as our common moral consensus in our culture today. But we, for our part, right, we want to make the Bible the foundation for our thinking in every area. We accept what God's word says is truth and we reject things that 
go against God's word. Which brings us to our scripture verse this morning, John 5, 46 and 47. He was speaking to the Jews, right? And he was said to them, if you believe Moses, you'd believe me for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Now, somebody might say, well, wait a minute. He wasn't, Jesus wasn't talking about the creation evolution debate with these people. No, he wasn't. He was speaking on the authority of God's word. If people aren't willing to believe what Moses said, and he wrote Genesis, then how will we believe what Jesus says when it comes to issues like sin and salvation? Another verse very similar to that is found in John 3, verse 12. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? This was as he was speaking to Nicodemus. And in John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, if I don't believe this, then I'm not going to believe that. Do you see the connection here, people? A person who's been indoctrinated in evolutionary thinking has no foundation for understanding fundamental issues of sin and salvation. Now, at this point, we could ask the question, is the Bible a science textbook? And we can say, thankfully, no, it is not, because science textbooks change all the time. Because why? Because they're based on fallible, sinful human beings and their limited understanding. But we can say that the Bible is the history book of the universe. Okay? So what does this true history book of the universe, if it is true, if the history is true, then any science contained in that history must be true as well, by definition. So let's just do a quick rundown here, look at some things. An example, comparing the Bible to evolution and Darwinian thinking. In the area of biology, what does the Bible say? It says God formed man out of the dust. But what does Darwinian evolution say? That there was eventually a one-cell organism managed to evolve, managed to come to life, managed to figure out how to eat, figure out how to reproduce, okay? In terms of geology, the Bible tells us when God said, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth. But what does Darwinian evolution teach us? That there were long, slow, gradual, uniformitarian process. Uniformitarian mean they travel at the same rate, okay? The same things we see now happening, slow erosion, slow deposits of silt. That is what took place, and that's why the earth has to be millions of years old. What does evolution teach in terms of anthropology? Well, the Bible says that the Lord scattered them abroad upon the face of the earth. This is where we got the different languages, the different people groups. Evolution teaches that there was an ape man and an ape woman. They made ape-like noises, had ape-like kids, but eventually they became human. Okay, do you see what we have here? We have evolutionism attempts to make the Bible appear to be irrelevant. Newsweek magazine, April 2009, had this cover, and it said the decline and fall of Christian America. In this article, there was, in this magazine, in this issue, there was an article called The End of Christian America. And it, from that article comes this. It says, the number of people willing to describe themselves as atheist or agnostic has increased about fourfold from 1990 to 2009. That's a big quadruple jump, from 1 million to 3.6 million. Now, just for fun, I looked up the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventist Church membership, and the most recent figure I got was from December of 2018, and it listed it as 1,257,913. The atheists and the agnostics outnumber us by almost three to one, okay? So there is work to be done here. But before that can happen, okay, we need to ground ourselves. We need to be solidly grounded to know confidently that we can defend God's word from not only a historical, but from a scientific standpoint as well. Why? Because if they don't believe his writings, how will they believe Jesus' words? Well, there are some people that say, well, you know, this creation evolution debate, it's really just a side issue. I mean, we just have to tell them, tell them to, to, to love Jesus, trust Jesus, okay? Well, where are they going to learn to trust Jesus from? from God's word, okay? But you know what? The Bible doesn't say that this is a side issue. It says otherwise. If we pick up Hebrews at the end of chapter 10, in verse 38, it reads, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man shall draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back to perdition, 
but of them that believe to the saving of the souls. And then that takes us right into Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, our ancestors won God's approval. Now watch this, verse three. Through faith, we understand what? What's the first thing that the writer of Hebrews is telling us? That the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which appeared. In other words, God spoke it all into existence, okay? It didn't come about by some random accidental process. We can trust God's word from cover to cover, front to back. The Bible stands as a whole on its own, okay? What does that mean for us then? Evolutionism is a stumbling block for many people to accept the gospel of salvation. Why? Because they don't see a reason why they should have to believe God's word as inspired, infallible truth. Now, how do I know personally that this issue is critical for this period of Earth's history? Because I see that God is raising up an army, but not the kind of army we would think about. And uh, I like being in the Lord's army, and that was a good tune for the kids to play today. But I want us to be thinking about some of the people, some of the organizations, institutions, and people that God is raising up to help us equip ourselves so that we can defend God's word. One of those people is this man here by the name of Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel um, was the legal editor for the Chicago Tribune. He got his journalism degree from the University of Missouri and his law degree from Yale, so he's not a dumb cookie. He came out with a video and a book several years ago called A Case for Creator. Up until, uh, at the time, I would have said this was the best video you could ever share with somebody. If you had somebody who was a real hardcore evolutionist and you shared this video with them, they would either ask you a lot of questions or they would never talk to you again, okay? Because it's that powerful, okay? So you gotta be careful who you share it with, right? So, uh, but, but, but great evidence and, and being a legal mind, he knows how to lay out his argument very carefully so that he covers all of his bases in that. Something that's a little more uh, classically entertaining as this man, Dr. Job Martin, he was a dentist. He uh, lectured at, um, at uh, oh, I wanted to say Cornell, but no, it's in Texas. Um, anyway, he was, a, he, was, he was a dental professor at, at, um, in Texas. He came out with, he was challenged one day by some of his freshman dental students. Baylor is where he was at. Okay, thank you. It just came to mind. Uh, he came out, he was challenged by some of his first year dental students to investigate the claims of creation science. And he's like, sure, I'll go ahead and investigate with you. And they took him and showed him various different creatures, different critters, and, and said, how could this critter have evolved all these different components step by step by step randomly over time? And he's like, well, I don't think it could have. Well, let's look at the next critter. And it took him several years and he says, his stomach turned for about five years. And eventually he realized, no, I have to accept that God did create all these things. Or this man, Ray Comfort, he's with the way of the master. His gift is to be able to take a camera and a microphone and walk up to people on the street and engage them in conversation and get them to turn their thinking around in very short order. He's produced several videos. One of them is this, Evolution versus God, sharing the foundations of faith. And he goes up to college students and asks them if they believe in evolution and say, oh yeah, ask them for the proof. Well, I don't really, uh, can't really tell you. So then he goes to the university professors and he can't get them to give him one example of any kind of creature changing from one kind of creature to another creature. Another great resource was from this guy, Ben Stein. Okay, not only was he a comedian, but he was also an economist, has a degree in economics, and he's also a speechwriter. And many years ago, he was involved in the production of this video, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. Another great resource for people to get and uh, I highly recommend them. Last night in our preview, we saw a video produced by this man, Del Tackett. He's the creator of the Truth Project. And he recently came out with a video in uh, 2017, okay, not that many years ago, is Genesis history? I asked the question, how many, of you, how many people in last night's audience saw it? Didn't see very many hands go up. So I highly encourage more people to get this. And this is one of the resources that we will have available after this evening's meeting. Okay, after Sabbath, we'll have some book, uh, book and DVD table set up out there. And this is one that we were able to get at a very good price compared to standard retail price. And then, of course, there's this man, Ken Ham. He's the founder and CEO of the uh, Answers in Genesis ministry. They have the Creation Museum in Kentucky, which my wife and I visited about 12 years ago. And uh, more recently, they completed the Ark Encounter. This is actually a photograph taken 
the evening before the Ark Encounter exhibit was to open to the public. God gave them this incredible sunset up there in the upper left corner. Ken Ham was involved in a book recently published called Already Gone, Why Your Kids Will Quit Church and What You Can Do to Stop It. In that book, a survey conducted by the American Research Group revealed that the number one reason most young people leave the church is boring sermons. No. Okay. Lengthy prayers. No. That wasn't it at all. Okay. Nothing to do in youth group. No, that wasn't it either. It was that science had disproven the Bible. And they found that it began mostly in elementary and middle school, not high school and college. Okay. So there's work to be done with the young people. Another excellent resource is this video, The Authority Crisis in the Church, Science or the Bible. Again, he's, Ken has a great way of teasing out, helping people understand the difference between supposed science and the Bible. And now about this time, somebody says, yeah, well, you know, that doesn't really apply to me because, I mean, my family's doing great. My kids went to church school. They know all the stuff. They, 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 they know it all. They've been raised from cradle roll, right? Well... You see, this isn't about us, okay? It's good that we are believers if we believe, okay? But we have neighbors, we have coworkers, we have friends, we have family members, okay? And we have the, not just the responsibility, but the privilege of reaching out and sharing the good news of God's word with them. And I'm reminded of a situation where shortly after I put these uh, talks together, I was invited by the Grants Pass Oregon Church to come down and give a talk there, similar to what we're doing here this weekend. Between two of the meetings, I was approached by a lady. I'm not very good at guessing someone's age, but I say she was probably in the mid-40s, whatever. She came up to me, and her eyes were almost ready to start spilling tears. And she said, do you have any resources you can help me share with my son? I said, well, what exactly is going on with your son? She said he was raised in the church. He went from cradle roll all the way up, sent him to Christian school, sent him to academy. He eventually got out on his own and got into the workforce. And people, young people his age in his, in his job said, oh, you're a Christian. Well, how can you believe the Bible? And they started challenging him with questions that he did not have answers to. And she said he's walked away from God. He's walked away from the church. He's walked away from the faith. Is there anything you can help me share with him? And she was desperate to know if there was anything I could help her with. So I directed her to a few things. Now, I'm not sharing this to sound like I'm being disrespectful to Christian education. Just because I was a public educator, I believe very highly in Christian education. Okay, I'm just saying in this particular case, his education failed him when it came to him being able to defend what he believed. Okay, But we don't have to let that continue to happen. Psalm 19, verse 1, tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Again, the devil knows that the natural world, when viewed correctly, will lead people to a knowledge of God. But we, for our part, we can't take our belief in creation for granted if we're going to be effectual in reaching these Greeks, okay? The secular-minded person believes that science has disproved the Bible, and so there's consequently no need for God in his or her life, and they simply turn their nose up at it. So what must we do to prepare ourselves to stand for the truth of God's word in this increasingly secular world? Well, 1 Peter 3 gives us the guideline. He tells us, first of all, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. That's the first thing. We dedicate ourselves to God, but also to the defense of of his word. And then it tells us to always, not mostly always, not sometimes, to always be prepared to give an answer. To whom? To everyone who asks us to give the reason for the hope that you have. Okay? Now, hypothetically, if somebody were to say to you, why are you a Christian? Why did I bring that on? If somebody were to ask you, why are you a Christian? You say, well, uh, because my parents raised me that way. Okay. Well, that might be true, but would that be sufficient to help this person? If you said, uh, why do I believe the Bible? Why am I a Christian? Uh, because uh, I went to an evangelistic meeting one time and I accepted what the preacher said. That might be true, but would that be adequate? Would that be sufficient for this person? Okay. Do you see what we're saying here? 
is that we have to have really good reasons that we can articulate to others as to why we believe what we believe. 2 Corinthians 10.5 tells us we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So to do that, everybody can learn a few scientific facts that refute evolution. Use them as conversation starters. You see, you don't have to, you don't have to lay out a big, strong case to prove creation. All you need to do is help pull the rug out from evolution. And you do that carefully with people, okay? If you're, if you're going to try to convince them to reject evolution and accept creationism, you're asking them to turn their worldview upside down. And you don't do that recklessly. You do it very carefully and prayerfully. Let's say you know somebody who likes birds, okay? Uh, you might one day say, have you ever thought of what it would take to turn a lizard's scale into a feather or a lizard's limb into a wing? Like, wow, that would be a pretty lousy leg before it ever became a functional wing. How would that creature ever survive in the survival of the fittest? And they might say, well, I never thought about that. Okay, just one example. Remember, evolutionism teaches that man, independent of divine revelation, determines for himself or herself what is truth. Now, back in Martin Luther's day, people didn't come up to Martin Luther and say, Brother Martin, why do you believe the Bible? I mean, don't you know about radiometric dating? I mean, we have proof that the rocks are millions of years old, okay? They didn't say that to Martin Luther. Why? Well, because radiometric dating had not been invented yet, so. With John Calvin, people didn't come to John Calvin and say, Brother Calvin, how can you believe in God's word? I mean, don't you know about this distant starlight? I mean, we have these stars and galaxies that are billions of light years away, and you say it's only 6,000 years. How could we see the light from them if it's only 6,000 years old? They didn't challenge him with that. In William Miller's day, people didn't come up to him and say, Brother William, don't you know about the Miller-Urey experiment where these scientists from the University of Chicago pass these gases through this little spark chamber and it created some amino acids, the building block of life? Well, no, they didn't because that experiment took place in 1953. And it created a few amino acids, but it also created tars and other toxins. And it also created left and right hand amino acids, which are not suitable for life. So it really didn't prove anything. But what I'm showing you here is that the devil prepares a different line of attack against God's word with each subsequent generation. What is our generation in 2022 up against? They're up against a whole lot of stories that evolution is true. But we need to equip ourselves to meet these attacks that are being waged against the Bible in these last days. There is one more reason why this issue is vitally important to the Christian community today. And I think you know of this one. It has to do with three particular angels. And we know about Revelation 14.6 and 14.7. Okay. And in verse 14, verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. It doesn't say to worship the baby who was born to a virgin. It doesn't say to worship the man who brought sight to the blind, or even the one who raised the dead from life, even though all of those three things are scientifically impossible. It is a call to worship God as creator, which is really a call to biblical authority. It is a call to biblical authority. And the first angel's message is foundational for angel number two. And that, in turn, is foundational for angel number three. These are all predicated on the first angel's message. Again, the crucifixion of Christ was a critical, the most critical event in human history. But we also know that this same Savior who died was the creator. Those two roles are met in one person. 2 Corinthians 5.18, now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's a good thing, people. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Everyone can have an active part in proclaiming the first angel's message to a perishing world. We don't have to let Sean Boonstra and Doug Batchelor have all the fun. <laughs> 2 Timothy 
tells us this, be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. And not only teaching, but defending the word of truth. We do that by making the Bible the foundation for our thinking in every area. Can we really have an active part in defending God's word to a perishing world? My response is absolutely. How many of you would like to join me and others in proclaiming this first angel's message to a perishing world? Then I invite you to stand, please, with me, and we will have the final scripture and then our closing hymn. Our final scripture is 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Please bow your heads with me. Lord Jesus, my prayer for us all today is that we would become zealous defenders of your word. May we see a little bit better how to take your word to a perishing world so that they can understand the plan of salvation, that they can be a part of the great reunion that you have been planning for all this time so that the redeemed can live eternally in heaven. We don't want them to suffer the fate of the non-believers. And we all have people that we are praying for. We all have people that we are concerned about that we want to see saved in your kingdom. I pray that as we go forward from this day, as we will continue to learn more about the truths that are supported by the history of your word, that we may be effective in helping other people to see how much you love them, just like you love us. In the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen.